everyone and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here my name's Alexa Ray and welcome to another video I'm so glad you're here I'm so glad you clicked on today's video we are going to be talking about all the books I read in the month of August I read a total of six books in the month of August which is pretty average for me I range between five to eight books every month so six books is a pretty good reading month for me we read some fantasy books some romance books it was honestly just a super fun reading month but what made August so amazing is that every book I read was actually a five star rating not surprising knowing the type of reader I am one of the books we read is Love Theoretically by Allie Hazelwood you guys know I'm a huge huge Allie Hazelwood fan and this is actually the book of the month edition which thank you so much to book of the month for sponsoring today's video you already know I am such a big fan of book of the month I'm such a big book of the month girly they are literally my favorite subscription service I have ever been a part of the excitement I get every month waiting for that little blue box to show up at my front doorstep unmatched if you're not familiar with book of the month you're about to get real familiar with that book of the month is a super popular and fast-growing online book service for readers every single month this cutie little blue box will show up at your doorstep with your book of the month pick their mission is to promote new and emerging authors and help readers discover books they love and how it works is their team basically vets hundreds of books each month and gives readers their choice from a curated selection of new and early release titles just so you can spend more time reading and less time researching which I absolutely love book of the month is also completely risk-free so you can skip any month anytime and you won't be charged plus they have the best price for new release hardcover fiction you can get your first book for just $9.99 using the code cider I just picked up two more books from them we have you again by Kate Goldback. This just looks so fun. It's supposed to be a romance. And then we also have The Stranger Upstairs by Lisa M. Matlin, I believe. This is giving off all the spooky fall vibes. I'm here for it. I am so excited for fall. It's so exciting to get these hardcover books every single month at my doorstep. Something else I absolutely love with Book of the Month is that you get cutie little bookmarks sent to you as well. I literally only use these bookmarks when I'm reading, but I could not recommend a Book of the Month enough. They're they're like my absolute favorites. I am just obsessed with them. So go check them out. You can get your first book for just $9.99 using the code CIDER. I highly, highly recommend. It is such a steal. But with all that being said, we are going to hop right into my August wrap up. So the first book we read in the month of August is King of Pride by Anna Hong. Also, if you would like any extra details on the books I'm going to mention in today's video, definitely go check out previous reading vlogs of mine. They cover every book I read on my channel. We do in-depth reviews. We talk about them in the comments. So definitely Definitely go check out past reading vlogs if you want more details if you have questions on them king of pride is the first book we read in the month of august this is book two in the kings of sin series i am so excited because i just saw that king of greed is coming out later this year i'm so excited because anna hong is definitely one of my favorite favorite authors i am obsessed with the twisted series which i know is kind of controversial some people like it other people don't like it I'm obsessed with it. I loved it. This is her newest series, the Kings of Sin series. King of Wrath is book one and it's about Dante and Vivian. We actually see Dante and Vivian briefly throughout the Twisted series, which I thought was really cool. In King of Pride though, we're introduced to Kai and Isabella, who are totally new characters in this universe. We briefly meet them in King of Wrath. Basically what we see happen in this book is Kai is in the running to become CEO of this company that has been in his family's power for like the longest time and he's nervous because because he feels like he's gonna lose the CEO vote to someone else. We're watching Kai fight for this position throughout the whole story. Isabella is actually a bartender who works at Valhalla, which is like this elite club where all the billionaires and CEOs of New York City go to hang out and socialize and network, I guess you could say. She's a bartender there, and so her and Kai are very familiar with each other. They see each other all the time at the bar. Aside from being a bartender though, Isabella is actually trying to become an author she's working on her novel at the moment that's something we kind of watch her struggle with throughout the story is trying to finish her book so she can send it in Isabella is also in the same friend group with Vivian who is Dante's wife so we have that connection there she's friends with Vivian who is Dante's wife Dante is best friends with Kai so that's another way that Isabella and Kai kind of end up being pushed together they're always going to dinner parties together events together this book definitely gave off invisible string vibes by 
Taylor Swift in my opinion. It just felt like they were being pulled together by an invisible string the entire story. I loved their love so, so much. Ty is super nerdy and smart. He's a workaholic and when he's not working, he's reading his books, translating them from English to Latin, from Latin to English. He's very confident in everything he does. He also always goes about matters in a very graceful way as opposed to Dante who in book one is very aggressive. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty. He's not afraid to get into fights with people. Kai is like the complete opposite. He would rather do everything the right way, the clean way. I thought it was really cool because if you're familiar with the Twisted series and King of Wrath, they do have a dark romance aspect to them because all the guys are <laughs> kind of violent in some way or another. There's always blackmail involved, fighting, or just something along those lines. Whereas in this book, Kai is like the complete opposite of that. It was really cool and kind of like a breath of fresh air when reading this because Kai is totally against all of the things that the other guys are kind of for. So I thought that was really cool. It's very different. I really adored Isabella's character. I thought she was so sweet. I love how independent she is and how driven she is to work throughout this entire story. It was so cute. It got me in all the feels. It was a five-star read. A lot of people didn't like this book and I was super surprised and I think it's because, again, it is very different from her other books. But nonetheless, I absolutely loved it. The whole time while reading this, I just knew they were endgame. I knew that no matter what was thrown their way, they would make it out together because you could just tell that they were soulmates in this. It was just absolutely adorable and they are faced with a lot of problems throughout the story because Isabella is a bartender while Kai is a billionaire, almost CEO. So in the public eye, they don't necessarily look good together or match well together. There's a lot of gossip articles that come out about them and people just putting their two cents in, which is so dumb in my opinion. We see how that affects Kai though while running for CEO. A whole bunch of stuff happens in this book, but it was a super fun read. I highly recommend. Her writing style is very easygoing, fast paced. I was never Board. Following that, we read Crossed by Emily McIntyre. This is a Never After novel. If you're not familiar, they're basically dark reimaginings of classic fairy tales we've grown up with. This is a Hunchback of Notre Dame reimagining, and I have to say, going into it, I was a little bit nervous because I loved that movie growing up, but it definitely wasn't like my all time favorite Disney movies. I didn't know how much I would enjoy this, being that it wasn't a favorite of mine. I have never been more wrong about a book in my entire life. This is actually probably my favorite book out of the entire series. For the longest time, Hooked and Scarred were like my favorites, but this is incredible. I am obsessed with this story. It's really dark. If you're interested in reading these books, definitely check for trigger warnings and stuff like that because there's some really crazy twisted things that happen throughout these books. It's so good if you're in the mood for a dark romance. This tells the story of Cade and Maya though, Cade is Father Cade Frederick. I believe. He's a French priest. Kate is transferred to a church in Vermont that has a French history or something like that. He's basically transferred there because they're having a lot of problems. The town is kind of going downhill, so they're hoping with bringing him in, they'll be able to help clean up the town and make it a better place to live for people. And Amaya is kind of like the outcast in the town. Her and her brother had a very hard upbringing and the town just kind of looked down on the two of them and it's really sad. Amaya is doing her very best though to support her and her brother. She works crazy hours to bring in enough money and food for them. Amaya does have this connection to a man named Parker in the story who is like a really big, big shot in town. He has a lot of money and everyone respects him and kind of, kind of bows down to him, honestly. Whatever Parker wants, he gets. He has always sought after Amaya. He's obsessed with her and wants her to be with him. But Parker's not a good person. He's actually like the villain in this story and he does a lot of terrible, terrible things, which if you read this, you will see. Check for trigger warnings. So we're watching Amaya struggle with Parker because he's so persistent and he's just like an awful human being. And then we have Father Cade who comes into town trying to clean the town up. Parker is very used to having the church under his control and kind of doing whatever he wants them to. And when Father Cade comes in, he denies Parker that type of control and says that's not how this is gonna work. We see a little conflict there. Amaya catches Cade's eye. He 
just kind of starts looking out for her and her brother. He starts doing things for them. We kind of see this like snowball effect throughout the story, how no matter how far away he tries to save from her, he can't help it. While he's trying to fix the town festival and rid the town of its sins, he's struggling between what's right and wrong, the church and love, and just all this crazy, crazy stuff happens. But I loved this so, so much. I thought Emily McIntyre really outdid herself with this one. It's by far my favorite Never After novel in the series. All of her books are standalone, so if you didn't want to read her other books, but you wanted to jump into this one, you totally could. None of the books are connected in any way. This book just really got me though. It's a book that I have been thinking about all month long, to be honest. I don't think I will ever get Cade and Amaya out of my mind. They were just so perfect in this. I loved how much Cade stood up for Amaya and the things he did for her. It's crazy and twisted as it was. It was just one of the best dark romances I've read in such a long time. Something else I thought was really cool, and if you're familiar with Emily McIntyre, you already know this, but she's notorious for leaving Easter eggs in her books to kind of hint towards what her next book may be about, and she did confirm there is going to be one more Never After novel. But I feel like we had a lot of Little Mermaid Easter eggs throughout Crossed, and so I'm hoping we see a Little Mermaid reimagining. I feel like there were so many hints and scenes in that book that hinted towards the Little Mermaid, so I think it'd be really fun either way. That was another five-star read. Crossed was so, so good. I could not recommend it enough. Check for trigger warnings, but it's incredible. <laughs> then we jumped in to some fantasy books in the month of August. I, guys, these fantasy books I'm about to share with you are some of the most hyped up fantasy books of 2023 for a good reason. I could not believe how good these books were. I was in shock because usually when fantasy books are super hyped up, they're definitely hit or miss for people, but both of these books were hits for me. I've not stopped thinking about them. Luckily, their sequels are coming out later this year, but they were just incredible. So the first one we have is Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. This was, you guys know, you already know, unless you're living under a rock, you probably already know what this book is. It literally went out of stock at every bookstore ever. They finally restocked it. I got my hands on it. I was so tempted to actually buy two copies of this book. I want to try and paint the edges myself. I may still do that because I think the books are now just in stock for good. The Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. I was very hesitant at first because this is like a dragon type of fantasy. It revolves around the world of dragons and riders, scribes and healers, stuff like that. The main character in the story is Violet Sorengal. She is the daughter of a rider and a scribe and growing up she always wanted to be like her father. She wanted to be a scribe. She would spend all her time in the library and books, writing. When she finally reached of age, her mother was basically like, you're gonna go be a writer. Even though you don't want to be a writer, you're gonna be a writer because no daughter of mine is going to be a scribe. She forces Violet to go be a writer, which is a very, very dangerous endeavor. Writers are sent to Basgath War College and you either make it out or you don't. So the only option to getting out of the school is to survive and it's very, very hard. These students have to go through a lot of trial, tasks, quests. They have to fight each other. The majority of them don't make it out of the school because they end up dying, which is crazy and very extreme. Not to mention Violet is definitely on the smaller side. She's very petite. She's very weak, which I feel like is the case in every fantasy book ever. I feel like the female main character is always this petite, weak little thing. Why? I don't know. She's not very strong at all compared to the other students in the college who have probably been training their whole lives to get to this point. Most people in the book kind of look at her as the weakling, so they see that'd be easier if they killed her off. Then they're ensuring more of their success. The rest of the people who don't want to do that want to kill her because she's her mother's daughter. I believe her mother is like high up in the government. She's a leader or something. People don't like her for that reason as well, including Zayden, who is our main male character. The enemies to lovers in this book really got me. I was living for it the entire time. We meet so many other characters throughout this book though. The found family is definitely there. You guys know I'm a sucker for a good found family trope. And when I did my fantasy reading vlog, the best way I could explain this book, which is so bad, I have to stop doing this, but I compared this to the Akatar series and Zayden was definitely giving off all the Batboy vibes, which I loved. And then one of Violet's old friends, Dan was giving off hardcore Tamlin vibes and I honestly I was cringing so hard whenever there was a scene between her and Dane. He felt that 
Violet wouldn't make it through the college because she's not strong enough, she'd get killed off, she's not smart enough. There were so many scenes throughout this story where Violet would go to tell him something and he would accuse her of not telling the truth. It was just a lot of back and forth with Dane, which drove me crazy, but it really reminded me of Tamlin from Akatar. This was absolutely incredible. I really loved when we got to the part where they were starting to bond with dragons. I thought that was such a crazy little plot twist we get in here when Violet starts bonding to dragons. Her and Zayden's relationship throughout this story is definitely a bumpy one, but it's worth every single page. Every word that leads up to the main event is just so worth it. I loved Zayden's character. He was so caring towards Violet and honestly really hard on her at times, but he just wanted to push her to become stronger. He knew that Violet was petite and a little bit on the weaker side, but he also knew that she was super smart and she'd be able to make it through. I have to say the plot twist at the end too, I didn't see coming and so many people say it that they saw it coming, but it totally caught me off guard. The way it ended just like had my mind spinning and spinning for hours trying to process what I had just read, but also wonder what's going to happen next. Book two is Iron Flame and I believe that's coming out in October. I think it's October and I cannot wait to continue this story. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't really know where Violet stands with everyone else. It's going to be quite the story, but I am very, very excited for it. This was an infinity read for me. I loved this so, so much. It was such a good fantasy book. It's definitely one of those books that you read and it makes you want to read other fantasy books because it was just so fun and exciting. And I do think if you're getting into the fantasy genre, this would be a great starter book opposed to the Akatar series because there's so much that happens in that series. It can get a little overwhelming and confusing whereas with this one it's a little bit more easygoing and smoother and the characters are a little bit easier to remember. I thought this is incredible. I think it's a great starter fantasy read. Following Fourth Wing though, guys, if you take any books away from today's video, please take this book away. It is my favorite book of all time. I'm not even kidding. If you're familiar with my channel, if you've watched previous videos, a lot of you know that Archer's Voice has been my favorite book for the longest time. It still very much is. It's my favorite romance, but as for like my favorite 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 book of all time. It has been demoted <laughs> and it has been replaced with Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. This is another very very popular book. It blew up quickly on TikTok and it went out of stock everywhere. They recently restocked it. I was able to get my hands on it. I am unwell. I knew I was going to enjoy this book just from reading the little blurb about it but I didn't know I was going to enjoy it to the point where I was like oh this is going to be my new favorite book of all time. This book caught me by surprise. I am obsessed with it. If you've read Divine Rivals, I'm sure you are also obsessed with it. This book has my heart and I actually was very, very fortunate. Give you a little backstory. I got this copy from Barnes & Noble and I read it and I became very obsessed with it and I wanted to get my hands on a special edition copy of it, but they are very hard to find. There's a limited quantity of them out in the world and if you do find them, you have to pay like a gazillion dollars for them. So I was very upset. I really wanted to get my hands on a special edition and I was very very fortunate a few days ago to actually get two special edition versions of Divine Rivals. I was able to get the Fairy Loot version which is absolutely stunning. I love the cover. I love the hardcover. I love the sprayed edges. Everything about it is just so so beautiful and I was also able to get the Owl Crate version which crazy beyond me. I am obsessed with this version. I love the typewriter. I love the flowers. I love the quote on the back of the book. It is honestly probably my favorite quote from this entire book. So I was able to get my hands on these two books. They're currently on their way to me. I cannot wait to have them in my hands. I'm going to put them on like one of my shelves in my bedroom on display. But I'm very excited and fortunate to have gotten my hands on them. Divine Rivals was a roller coaster. It was so good. The sequel is coming out later this year. I think it comes out in December, which I'm a little sad about because I don't want to wait that long. I just, I can't wait. I am so excited. And I already know this is going to be my favorite read of 2023. If I read another book this year that tops this one, I will be very, very surprised. The way I feel about this book is so different from any other book I've read so far this year. This tells the story of Iris and Roman though. They are basically rivals. We have an enemies to lovers in here. They're both fighting for the same position at the Gazette, which is like a newspaper place where they write and work. So right from the beginning, we are thrown into this little enemies to lovers position. This story does take place in 
the middle of a war between gods. Iris's brother, Forrest, goes off to fight for the war though, and he leaves Iris and her mother back at home. Unfortunately, Iris's mother kind of falls into this weird rabbit hole. She's struggling with addiction, and honestly, it's clear that she's struggling with depression since her son is gone. So Iris quits school to go work at the Gazette to hopefully bring in money for her family, bring in food. So she's fighting very, very hard for this position at the Gazette because she needs the extra money. Roman Kit comes from a wealthy family and he is fighting for this position because if he doesn't get it, his family's basically going to like disown him or shame him. His family's very strict and honestly kind of mean to Roman. So even though he comes from a wealthy family, it's still a very sad life that he's growing up in. Iris begins to write letters to her brother Forrest when she misses him. She's trying to keep him updated and just ask where he is as well to make sure he's safe and okay. She's never had an actual address to send the letters to because Forrest never sent the address to her when he got to base. So what Iris does is she types up these letters to her brother on her typewriter and then she slips them into her wardrobe at night just in hopes that in some crazy wild way Forrest will receive her letters. When she looks behind her wardrobe the next day she finds that her letters are gone. So they are going somewhere which makes Iris very happy but they're not going where she thinks they're going. They're actually ending up in the hands of her rival Roman Kit who then begins to write letters back to Iris. They begin going back and forth with each other but Iris doesn't know that she's corresponding with Roman. She thinks she's corresponding with some random guy somewhere in the world. It's a very wild story how the two of them come together and grow closer. Eventually Iris finds herself searching for Forrest. She finds herself on the front lines of war and battle. I absolutely fell in love with their love in this. The romance is... I have been swooning over this book since I finished it in August. I literally don't think I'll ever stop thinking about it. The way I feel about Archer's voice is the same exact way I feel about Divine Rivals. It just is like living in me right now. I can't stop thinking about it. I can't stop thinking about Roman and Iris. The way Roman follows Iris into war to keep her safe and protect her. This is so good, guys. I can't say too much about their relationship and what happens because I don't want to spoil it, but you just have to take my word for it. The romance in this book is the best romance I've read ever. This book was giving off soulmate vibes. It definitely reminded me of Invisible String by Taylor Swift. Everything about this was just so, so perfect, and I'll never stop thinking about it. And I can't wait to get the special edition covers, and I can't wait to share those with you because I know they're going to be absolutely stunning. If you take any books away from today's video, definitely take away Divine Rivals. It's worth it. It's so good. So after I finished Divine Rivals, I actually took a little break from reading because it was such a good book that I just had to sit with it for a while. I'm still sitting with it, to be completely honest. I am kind of sad that I can't reread that book for the first time again and reread Roman and Iris's story. It was so, so beautiful. Like, I wish I could tell you more, but I don't want to spoil it. So eventually, a few days later, a week later, I decided to pick up our next read, which was Love Theoretically by Allie Hazelwood. Another five-star read. This was so good. I am such a big Allie Hazelwood fan. The Love Hypothesis is one of my favorite books ever. Love on the Brain was a little iffy for me, but I still really enjoyed it. This recently came out, I want to say like a month or two ago. I think it came out earlier this summer, and I was a little hesitant at first because Love on the Brain wasn't my my favorite but I'm so happy I jumped into it because this was absolutely incredible. We do get a small Adam and Olive cameo in here from the Love Hypothesis which I was just living for. I needed that cameo so bad and it made my heart so happy to see Olive and Adam again because I've missed them so much. This tells the story of Elsie and Jack. If you are familiar with Allie Hazelwood books you know that she's like the queen of writing women in STEM. Her books always revolve around science and women. There's always a good enemies to lovers in here and that is exactly what we get with Elsie and Jack. We get the perfect enemies to lovers. Elsie is a theoretical physicist and Jack is an experimental physicist. There's this huge divide between both groups because of an article that was posted years before kind of dissing theoretical physicists and what they stand for it created this big divide between the physicist and they kind of hate each other I guess you could say. That's where the enemies to lovers kind of sparks in here between the two of them. This was another book that really got me though. It was a he falls first trope. It was an enemies to lovers trope. 
I really loved Jack's character. He's very, very smart and confident, but so is Elsie. So I think they're like the perfect match for each other. Even right from the beginning when there's that enemies to lovers between them, Jack is always taking care of Elsie. He always has her back. He's making sure she's okay, that she's safe. And I just really liked that about him. Elsie is also notorious for being a people pleaser. She's like the ultimate people pleaser, honestly, because when she meets someone, she immediately molds to the type of person she thinks is perfect for that person. That's something we kind of see her struggle with throughout the entire story because she's always trying to be the perfect person to whoever she's around and she's never actually being her real authentic self. Elsie doesn't really know what she likes or what she wants because she's always busy trying to be what everyone else likes and wants. Jack immediately sees right through her. He really pushes her to stand up for herself, be herself, and really not worry about what other people think, which I thought was really cool and I liked seeing that a lot. Jack teaches Elsie how to let go of that part of herself where she feels the need to be perfect for everyone but Elsie also teaches Jack how to let go and how not to hold grudges because this article that created this massive divide between both groups is actually written by Jack and the article really ruined the entire field that Elsie has always wanted to be a part of. It also ruined her mentor's career and she looks up to her mentor tremendously throughout the whole story so she helps Jack in that aspect kind of let go of grudges and helps him learn how to move forward and stuff like that. They both help each other in different ways and I love that when it comes to relationships and books. And yeah, this was just really sweet. It's another book that got me in all the feels. I took so many good quotes away from it. I am obsessed with Jack and Elsie. Very much like Adam and Olive, they just stole my heart immediately. And then last but not least, I have Assistant to the Villain by Hannah Nicole Mayher, I believe. This cover looks so cool. It has red sprayed edges and it just sounds so fun and exciting. It's basically about this girl named Evie who becomes this villain's assistant. The villain is named Tristan and he is known around the kingdom for doing very very bad things, basically villainy things. And when Evie is in need of work and a job, she's trying to support her family back home. She falls in the hands of the villain and she agrees to become his assistant. I'm actually not done with this book but I wanted to put it in here because I am in the middle of doing a reading vlog with it but I wanted to show you guys it anyways, show you guys what we have to look forward to in the month of September. I think this cover is just so much fun. I think going into this, I thought there was going to be an enemies to lovers trope, but there's really not. It's more of a grumpy meets sunshine trope. And Evie is just always surprising Tristan because no matter how gruesome or bad things get, Evie is just totally normal and fine about it, which kind of throws Tristan off because normal people get very nervous and scared when they see stuff like that. But Evie is always very calm and collected and she's like the best assistant to him. So, so far this is a super fun read. I'm loving the Grumpy Meets Sunshine. I'm loving the dynamic we're getting between Evie and Tristan. I do think it might be a he falls first trope as well, which I kind of like because he's the villain. There's also a lot of funny scenes throughout the book I've just been laughing about while reading. I think the type of writing style is meant to make the book more exciting and funny, so I'm really enjoying it. It's definitely different from other books I've read, but I'm really enjoying it. I'm excited to see where it goes. I don't know if it's going to be a five-star read just yet. It's kind of slow. It's definitely a slow burn romance, but it's pretty good so far. I am looking forward to finishing it up. Hint, hint, you guys will be seeing that book and love theoretically in a 24-hour readathon. That should be coming out very, very soon after this. But yeah, those are all the books that I read in the month of August. We read six books total. I feel like six books is pretty good for me. I know there's so many people out there who can read like 10 to 20 books every month. I've just never been that type of reader. I'm definitely on the slower side when it comes to reading so don't mind my itty bitty monthly wrap up but I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope you had fun. I hope you're able to take some new books away from today's video. If you take any books away it's so hard to say because every book I read in the month of August was so so good but I highly highly recommend Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. You will not regret it. It was such a fun and exciting read. I could not put that book down. I was so obsessed with the story right from the beginning. It's super fast paced and easy going as well. It's just, it's super fun. It's definitely one of my favorite books of 2023 and I'm so excited for the sequel to come out later this year. For today's video though, comment down below what books you read in the month of August and what you rated them. Share your reads in the comments, share your ratings. Don't be a gatekeeper. We can't gatekeep when it comes to books because I am always looking for new books. But that is all for today's video. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you in my next video.
uncomfortable